A little while back, there was um, there was a young man, and as, as young men tend to do, he was rapidly approaching his 16th birthday. And as he was approaching his 16th birthday, as most young men do, he started to think about the fact that, you know, at 16, I'll be able to drive. And so he approached his dad, and he said, you know, Dad, I, uh, I'm going to be 16 soon, and I'm hoping when I get to be 16 that you're going to give me a, a set of keys to the family car. His dad said, well, son, you know, I, I'm sure that, that that is a hope and a desire of yours. And, and, and son, there's, there's a few things your mother and I have hoped and desired for, and they've not all quite been the way that we've wanted them to be. And so here's what I'm going to do, son. Over the next three months until you get your license, um, we've been a little concerned about your grades. And so if you'll work on your grades and, and, and get your grades up, then, then that would help. But there's, there's two other things that I want to talk to you about, son. And he said, uh, he said you know, you're going to have to help pay for gas and pay for insurance. And, and so I want you to start working some. And the son nodded and said, okay, Dad. And he said, there's one more thing, son. He said, you know, your hair is a lot longer than, than, than what, what your mom and I like. And so I'd like for you, if, if you're going to be driving our family car, to get a haircut um, before you get your driver's license. And so the young man thought about it, and he went and he thought off and thought about it long and hard. He put together a game plan, and he... He started working extra hard on his studies, and he, he, he started doing better on his studies, and he started mowing some of the neighbor's lawns, and he started started making some extra money, and he even started going to church real regular with his mom and dad, because he knew that was important to him, even though he didn't ask. And He started thinking, and he, and he started actually learning some things at church, and, and it got real close, and, and on the eve of his 16th birthday, he came up and he said, Dad, he said, uh, he said have you given any more thought to that thing about the car keys? And, his dad said, well, son, you know, we, we noticed that um, noticed that you've worked real hard and that your grades have come up. We're real proud of you. I know, son, that, you know, you've set some money aside and been mowing yards and done real, real well with that. You've been going to church with us, and we didn't even ask you to do that. But that's blessed our heart, and we're really proud of that. But he said, son, there was one other condition, and I had, had talked to you about cutting your hair, and I, I noticed that you really haven't gotten a haircut. And the boy looked at his dad right in the eyes, and he said, you know, Dad, he said, I... Uh, he said, the funny thing is, he said, I've been in church with you, and he said, I noticed that, um, that Jesus had really long hair. <laughs> and his dad said, well, son, you know what? You're right. He did have long hair. And he said, but he walked everywhere he went. <laughs> he walked everywhere he went. So you want to drive the family car, you need to get a haircut. Praise God. Come on, somebody. You know, there is a measure of truth in that, um, in that Jesus walked most everywhere he went. I do take a little exception to that joke because there are a couple times that Jesus didn't walk, he just kind of flew. Amen? <laughs> Come on, somebody. We're looking forward to that day. We're looking forward to that flying moment. But for the most part during his ministry, for about three years, he walked most everywhere he went. And there's a reason for that. Um, there was something in place called, that the historians call the Pax Romana. P-A-X-R-O-M-A-N-A. -A. I think we've got it up on the screen. Uh, the Pax Romana is a fancy way of saying the Roman peace. At the time of Christ, the Roman Empire was so completely ruled, the Mediterranean world, that there was actually a really significant time of law and order and peace in history. If you can imagine, the Roman Empire was so massive and they had so conquered and so dominated the region that there actually was peace. I mean, the Roman government was in charge of everything. They said, this is the law, this is the way it is. They set everything in order. And so there was a great time of peace. Additionally, when they had conquered the Greek nation and put down the Hellenistic Empire, which was the Greeks, the Roman Empire actually adopted the Greek language, and the Greek language became the common language of politics, of learning, of commerce, and culture. Um, additionally, this, this great and wealthy Roman Empire began to build a network of roads throughout the Mediterranean region. So if you can imagine, there was this combination of this common language, basically the world was sharing for education or religious and government and political reasons, they were sharing a common language. And there was great peace, there was freedom from war and strife, there was just great order, there was law, there was safety, uh, relatively as people traveled, there was just an unprecedented and an unparalleled opportunity to travel. And is it with this perfect time in history that Jesus Christ came to the earth? It was not an accident. 
the, 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 the timing of his birth and the things that God orchestrated was purposely and perfectly orchestrated. There was no greater time in history, nor has there ever been since a greater time in history to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And this is the moment that God chose to send his son to establish his church at a time where there was a common language where the the maximum number of people could receive the gospel in a language they understood at the maximum amount of time when it would be safe and able to travel in the largest world kingdom there was and there was a system of roads and networks it was not an accident the timing and Jesus came to send this gospel message and to establish his church I want to talk to you today about scripturally, biblically defining what is church and why is church. Mm. Amen? Amen? Not 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 man's opinion, not religion's opinion, not, not what we think church ought to be or how it ought to be, but what is the biblical reason? What does the Bible say? What does God say that the church is and why the church is? Mm. Not just what, but why. We find out a lot about the why in Ephesians in the third chapter, beginning in the eighth verse. We'll look at the three verses there, eight through ten. Ephesians chapter three. I'll be reading out of the New King James this morning. We, we typically study out of the King James. This morning we're going to be looking at the New King James. Um, a word to you, teachers and preachers. Whenever you speak or minister or even if you write something, Always tell the translation. We've got so many different Bible translations out there. And so whenever you preach or teach or write or minister, um, make sure that you put out there what translation it is. Today we're going to be in the New King James, just to keep things easy as we digest this message. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. To me, Paul is speaking, to me, Paul, who am less than the least of all of the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Verse 10. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be know, made known by the church, to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Why is the church? The Bible tells us right there in verse 10 that the intent is that the wisdom, the manifold wisdom, which literally means the manifest wisdom, the visible wisdom of God may be made known by whom? By Jesus? By the church. That the manifold wisdom of God might be made known in the earth by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Please understand that heaven does not just talk about heaven, that, 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 that place that we plan to go when we leave this earth. There are multiple, there's actually three realms of heaven. We, we've got the, the place, our eternal home that we desire to go, but then we've got the atmosphere. And then we've got the earthly realm. There are actually three different heavens, heavenly realms, that the Bible speaks of. And so when it says in these heavenly places, it's speaking to all three levels of heaven. In fact, it's specifically speaking to the two that we see now, to the worldly atmosphere and to the atmosphere, the air around us. Amen? The Bible tells us that, that Satan is the prince of the air, that he is the prince of this world. Amen? That he is the ruler of this heaven. And so, literally, the purpose of the church is to come that the wisdom and the manifest power of God would be known through the church to the principalities and powers. Literally, Jesus Christ came to establish the church on this earth that we may return control of this earth to God's kingdom. When, when Adam and Eve fell, the, the world fell into chaos. Darkness came upon the land. Amen. We talked last week about darkness creeping on the earth. And, and there was evil, and there is evil in the atmosphere. There was disorder. God created the earth in order. Satan fell, and disorder came into the earth. And God has established the church in the earth to restore order. 
to take out evil. And we're told right here that basically in a modern day translation, God has established the church that the church may show the principalities and powers who's actually in charge. Amen? We have been sent here to take charge, to have authority in this earth. Amen? That is why the church is, that the glory of God, that the wisdom, that the power, that the might of God be seen through the church, that this earth be restored into right order, that we be restored into loving relationships, that we be restored into God's purposes. Amen? You with me? I don't hear a lot of people excited this morning about the power of God being sent through you to fix the brokenness of this world. Amen? Amen. Jesus said, I've come to teach you that through you, the brokenness of this world be healed. Amen? He's included us in the process. He's made us His church. Now, what is the church? It's not the building. It's the body. Literally, it's the assembly. Read with me, if you will, in Acts chapter 20, verses 28. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which He purchased with His own blood. You know, it's just me, but that doesn't sound like a real estate transaction. I don't see God sitting down going, you know what, I want that building over there. That's going to be my church, and I'm going to give you some blood to pay for it. Amen? He purchased us. He purchased the people. He purchased the body of Christ. We are the church. We, the people, are the church. It's not a building. All right? And, and we really need to understand this. If, if we want to be biblically based, I understand that in modern day language, when we say church, we're talking about a building. But that's not biblical. Nowhere in the Bible does church refer to a building or a place. It refers to us. That, that's, that's what it is. I mean, can you imagine this building campaign? Can you imagine if, if the pastor stood up and said, you know what, we're going to be like Jesus today. We're going to purchase a new building and I need everybody to give a quart of blood on the way out. And every Sunday you're here, I need you to leave a quart of blood, okay? I mean, I mean, come off now. I mean, they put enough pressure on you sometimes when they're trying to build a building now, right? Because sometimes it feels like they want blood, amen? Come on, they're trying to get blood out of you. But uh, sometimes it feels that way. But, 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 I mean, clearly... God did not pour out His blood to purchase a building. If He wanted a building, He would have just built it or He would have, would have, would have gotten it. He poured out His blood to purchase us. We're His church. We are the assembly. We are His body in this earth. And through us, through His body, He wants His wisdom, His love, His power to be seen. Wherever we are and whatever we do. Ephesians chapter 1, reading verses 18 through 23 in the New King James. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance and the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power towards us who believe, according to the working of His mighty power, which He worked in Christ, when he raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at the, his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under Jesus' feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him. Who fills all in all. Look at verse 22 and 23. If you think it's just a preachery thing, if you think I made up the notion that the body is the church, the scripture tells us in precise words in verse 22 and 23, Jesus Christ is head over the church, verse 23, which is his body. It doesn't say which is his building. It says which is his body. Amen. We are literally coming together with giftings and talents and experiences and resources and abilities and, and loves and strengths and weaknesses, hopes and hurts. He, God is masterfully assembling that together. That His work be done in this earth. 
not, not, not so that we can have a great big building, although it may happen one day, but He's assembling us for a purpose. Amen. Amen? Colossians chapter 1, verses 17 through 20. And He, Jesus, is before all things. And in Jesus, all things consist. Verse 18. And Jesus is the head of the body, the church. Just in case we missed it the first time. God's going to tell us over and over. Amen? Jesus is before all things, and in all, Jesus all things consist. Verse 18. Jesus is the head of the body, which is the church, who is the beginning. Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He may have the preeminence, in all things He may be first. For it pleased the Father God that in Jesus all the fullness of the Godhead bodily should dwell. And by Him to reconcile all things to Him, by Him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross. Hallelujah. That, that is about three months worth of teaching right there in those three verses. Amen? He is first. He is always first. He is the head. What is done is done to please Him. What is done is done for Him. And what is done in us is done by Him. Not by our works, but by His grace working in us. By His hand. And when power is released from us, it's not our power, it's His power. And when it's released, it's not for our purposes, it's for His purposes. And it's not for our glory or for our name or for our edifice. It is for His name and for His edifice in His glory. Amen. It is not for our fortune, it is for His fortune. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. He is the head of the body, which is the church. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 and 22. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now, those last three verses is, is a little more complicated way, and we get this analogy of the building and the, and the blocks very, very clearly, but it's still talking about us. It's literally saying that each of us is a building block in God's purpose, in God's plans. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. He's the one that holds everything up, that holds everything together, everything consists in Him. But we each have a purpose and a place to be. Amen? Amen. If we're missing, a block is missing out of what He's assembling. But if we're there, God has this puzzle and He's putting it together and He's got all these beautiful, wonderful pieces. And He's created every single piece differently and unique. Do you know no two people on the face of the earth ever created or that ever will be created have the same fingerprints? Mm -hmm. Do you realize that identical twins don't even have the same fingerprints? God has created every one of us purposely unique, beautifully, specially, and yes. wonderfully made. Amen. That He may fit the puzzle together for His purpose and His glory. Amen. And you are a piece and a part of that puzzle. You are a piece and a part of that equation. You are a piece and a part of that building. Your hurts and your helps, your strengths and your weaknesses, your experiences, your love, your gifts, your talents, and even that which you've squandered, every bit of that, God wants to mold that and shape that and put that into the perfect place that He may assemble what He has designed for His purpose, that His power be seen for His glory and His love to be known, manifest in this earth. And not just for us to see when we're in the church. But literally that the world out there, that all the demons in the sky, the devils in hell, and everywhere in between, may know the love, the love and the glory and the power of God demonstrated to those who are called according to His purpose and to His name. Amen? Amen. The church, should, the, the outside world should be looking in on the church and saying, man, you are so filled with God's love and God's peace. I am so tore up in this world. I want what you have. The world should be running to the church, not from the church. Amen. Amen. But sometimes the way the church behaves, it's no wonder that the world is running from the church instead of to the church. Amen. Sometimes some of us in the church want to run from the church and we got pretty good reason. Amen. The world should be running to us. We shouldn't be running from one another. We shouldn't be running from the church. I mean, do you, do you see a common theme? Do you see all these different scriptures we're pulling together? It's just talking about 
Jesus and the church and the body. It, nowhere, not even in this analogy, do we talk about it actually being a building. I've I got to tell you, I, I know some people, you know, they, 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 they may seek to assemble $3 million or, or, or $30 million to, to build a massive building to sit a lot of people in. And, and then they come into that building and they don't really know anybody's name. If I had a choice between having $30 million bills to build a building or having 30 million disciples across the face of the earth, I'll take the 30 million disciples every time. Amen? I would much rather be able to go to a different nation every week on this earth and know somebody that's a part of the church, somebody that's a part of our family, than I would to go to a $30 million building where I don't know most anybody and everybody walking into place. Amen? I mean, think about it. And I'm not knocking anybody. I mean, you know what? If your vision is to build a big building and that's what God's called you to do, that's what He's called you to do. Amen? And, and that's between you and God. That's not for us to judge or us to decide or evaluate. Mm -hmm. but, but what I know is, is if, from where I sit, from, from what I read, God called us to build a kingdom. He called us to, to, to work in, a, in, in the assembly process of the body. And, and, and a choice between 30 million disciples and 30 million dollars, I'll take the 30 million disciples every day. Because the last time I checked, we can't take the 30 million dollars with us. Amen? Mm -hmm. You've never seen, you've never seen a, a stockbroker or a U-Haul following anybody to the grave. Amen? You, you just, you, you you, you can take your checkbook in the box with you, but you won't be able to write any checks where you're going. Come on, somebody. But you know what? 30 million disciples you can take with you. Amen. Amen. Y'all can, yeah, we, we can have a party when we get to where we're going. Amen. Come on, somebody. Preach it much better than y'all letting on this morning. Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 16. Simon Peter answered Jesus and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to them, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. This is Simon, Simon Peter that we know so very well. Simon Peter who had these spectacular moments and Simon Peter who had these not so spectacular moments. Simon Peter who kind of reminds us a lot of us. Amen. We're, we're up one moment, we're down another, we're doing good and we're not so good. Come on somebody, God still loves us. Simon Amen. Peter answered and said, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed this to you but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we now know that, that Jesus Christ has taken Peter, and he's put the entire church and built it upon his shoulders, right? No, not really. Now, listen, I, again, not, not throwing darts at anybody, but there's a lot of things that are taught, and a lot of things that are, that are said out there, and, and there's a lot who believe that, that Peter is the foundation of the church. A lot have interpreted that and, and, and read that here. There's a funny thing that happens. This, is, as we said, remember it's the Roman peace, where the, the Bible is being written in Greek, and Greek is a very spectacular language. Um, there's actually Peter, the name Peter means rock. Amen. So when you translate Peter, it translates rock, and, and we read Petros, rock. Well, later on in the verse, it says, upon this rock, it says, you are Peter, you are Petros, and upon this rock, I will build my church. The funny thing is, and if we can get that slide up there that shows us, um, it actually says, upon this Petra. There's two different Greek words. The first word is Peter, which is Petros, which means a small stone. Literally, I mean, literally translated, it means a piece of rock. But then it says, upon this Petra, I will build my church, literally upon this large rock, this mass of stone. So literally, when we read this, what it's saying to us is, Peter, you are Peter, and Peter, upon the confession that you have just made, I will build my church. You see, the church is built upon a confession of faith. It's not built upon the shoulders of the Apostle Peter nor the Apostle Paul, nor anyone else. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Yes. Literally, Peter is a small stone. He is a piece of the building. Peter is a piece of the building, but there is a larger building, a mass of stone, which is literally the church, and it's the confession of faith that allows us to become a part of the assembly. So when we read this again, it says, And I say to you that you are Peter, you are a small rock, you are a piece and a part, and Peter, upon this greater rock, this confession of faith, saying that I am in fact Jesus, how does the Bible say that we're to get saved? We go into Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, and the Bible tells us that if we confess by faith and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. That is the confession of faith 
that brings us into the body of Christ, that makes us a part of the assembly. And once we become a part of that assembly, we become a rock, a building stone in the great big building. Amen? Amen. Amen. You with me, right? Amen. I know that goes contrary to some things that some people have been taught, but that's what the Bible says. Amen? There's a lot of different teachings and a lot of different things, and it's not out there to knock anybody. It's not out there to, to hurt anybody's feelings. It's just out there to say, this is what the Bible says. Now, do with it what you will. So, what is this mass of stone? What is this church, this assembly? An examination of the Greek word ecclesia, which is when we read the word church, 118 times in the Bible, we read the word church. Okay? We're preaching a little bit this morning. We're teaching a little bit this morning. The point is that we walk out of here learned and better than we came in. Amen? Amen. The Greek word ecclesia appears about 118 times in the King James Bible. And it is the Greek word that is translated, we translate in English as church, but the literal translation of it is assembly or congregation. Now listen, we're a non-denominational assembly here, we're a non-denominational group of believers, we're a non-denominational church. But I got to tell you, one of the things that the assemblies of God did is they got the name right. Amen. They probably named the church better than anybody in the history of the church has named the church. They said it's the assembly of God, and that's literally what it is. This word ecclesia, which we call church, literally means an assembly or a congregation. It is used to refer to a called out group of persons that are organized together for a common purpose and who meet together. A community of saints on heaven and in earth. That's a mouthful. We've got to repeat that. I know this sounds foundational. I know it sounds basic. But it is the revelatory power of God when we really get a hold of this. Listen to what this says. It's an assembly. And it's an assembly of people who are called out of where they are. Literally in the day, they would call out people from darkness, from places they shouldn't be, and call them into the assembly. It's not changed, folks. Is still the same body. Is still the same church. We should be calling out to those that are in darkness. Amen? Amen? We should be calling out to them that they know that they can come out of the darkness, that they know that there is a place of refuge, that there is a place of rest, that there is a place of safety and a place of love. They should be called out. And they should be called out by God. It's not enough that we speak to them and let them know that we're here. God's got to come along, and He's got to draw them. He's got to woo them. Because we can call them out all we want, but until God calls them, it ain't going to happen. Amen? Ain't hey, none of us got here without the Holy Spirit calling us. Ain't hey, none of us got saved without the Holy Spirit wooing our heart. You ain't never saved nobody. I ain't never saved nobody. We've called some folks, but we just happened to call them on the same day that the Holy Ghost was calling. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. They picked up the Holy, they picked up the phone thinking it was us calling. It was the Holy Ghost. And, yeah. and they answered, and they come into the assembly. It is an assembly. Literally, God is, is searching the earth to and fro, seeking the gifts and the talents that He has placed in men and women. And He is calling them together in a place that He may put together in a localized body, an assembly, a group of people that may move on the face of this earth. Hallelujah. Amen. That's something to get excited about. We're part of a great big plan. We're part of a great big purpose. We have literally been called out of where we were, called out of what we were doing, and we are being organized together for a common purpose. And we are meeting together for that common purpose. You think, well, you know what? I just came in here for an hour because I felt guilty about what I did last week. And I just came in here for an hour so I could feel better, so I could go on about my business. That may be what you think. But that ain't what God's thinking. Amen. God's got you set up from start to finish. He's got a trap made before you. And you are walking right into the hands of the Holy Ghost. You just think you're in charge. Come on, somebody. I'm still preaching better than y'all letting on this morning. Hey, think about this. If you're still hung up believing that the church is a building or it's a project or it's something that you assemble and put together rather than a group of people, check this out. This is kind of off topic, but Matthew chapter 18, verse 17 it says, and this is resolving a conflict, it's a whole other message for a whole other day, but it says, if, if he, if the, if the person that you go to shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let me tell you what, if I walk out of here this afternoon and you were talking to the building, I'm going to get concerned, okay? And I'm going to get extra concerned if the building answers you. If you tell me, you know what, I was telling the church, I was telling the building, and then the building answered. This is what the building told me to do about the situation. Okay, come on. 
don't be talking to the building. And goodness knows that the building answers, don't tell nobody, okay? Just keep that between you and yourself and, and, and nobody else. Amen? Between you and the building. The building is not the church. The building is the place where the church meets sometimes. Amen? The, the, the building is a place where an assembly can come together. Now, do we like for the building to be pretty? Do we like it to have nice stuff? Do we enjoy this air conditioning? Absolutely, we do. But you know what? There's people this morning right now that are just praising God and worshiping God without microphones and without air conditioners and without light systems. And, 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 and you know what? It, it's possible even that their praises are better than ours. Amen. It, it's not the facility. It's not the building. I mean, do we enjoy them? Sure we do. But it's not the building. It's, it's, it's the group of people that have been assembled. The Barna organization puts together statistics for... for organizations and um, in 2009 they published a study that was done the previous couple of years and um, it says that despite the substantial attention that's focused on what are called megachurches, Protestant megachurches, such congregations draw about 9% of adults who frequent a Protestant church. How about that? How many people feel like it feels like just everybody goes to a megachurch? Amen? Yeah. Studies tell us that about 9% of the body of Christ actually goes to a mega church. Wow. Now, they get a lot of press and, and they, they're very high profile and if you see, feel like there's a mega church in every corner, but the reality is that studies tell us about 9% of the body of Christ goes to a mega church. By contrast, about 41% of adults who attend a Protestant church associate with a congregation of 100 or fewer people. Okay? An additional 23% can be found at 101 to 200 and 18% go to 201 to 499, which tells us that almost half, almost half of the people in the body of Christ go to churches of less than 100 people in the congregation. Amen? You've got 9% in mega churches, and you've got almost half the body of Christ in churches less than 100 people. Who has more influence? Come on, somebody. Who has more influence? That's right. People look at mega churches and go, wow, they're changing the world. Really? They're affecting 9% of the body of Christ. You've got all these little broom closet corners and places around town, less than 100 people. Come on, somebody. Barna went on in, in 20 and 12. Um, this is, this is kind of spooky. Um, the survey in 2012 probed the degree to which people say their lives had been changed by attending church. Oh, come on, man. It's fixing to get ugly. You know it is. <laughs> Overall, one quarter of Americans, 26% of Americans, who had been to church before said they had a life that had been changed or affected greatly by attending church. Another 25% described it as somewhat influential. Nearly half, 46%, said there was no real change in their life even though they went to church. Hello. That ain't good at all, folks. Come on now. You know, I may not be a math whiz, but I can do that math. Almost half of the American adults that say they're going to church say their life really hasn't changed as a result of going to church. I wonder where those folks are going to church or otherwise. Um, another study in 2012, you know, we laugh and we joke, but that's really a place that we ought to cry. Um, another study in 2012 told us this, again by the Barnett Group, one of the most significant gaps uncovered by their research was the fact that most people cannot recall gaining any new spiritual insight the last time they attended church. When asked to think about their last church visit, three out of five church attenders, literally 61%, said that they could not remember a significant or important new insight or understanding related to their faith. Even among those who attended church in the last week, half admitted they couldn't recall a significant insight that they had gained. Oh boy. We got 9% of the folks in mega churches, churches over 1,000 people. That's how they define a mega church. 9% of the people in churches over 1,000 people. Half the people going to church said there's no real change in their life. And two thirds of the people said the last time they went to church, they didn't really get nothing significant out of it. They didn't learn anything new. Gee, I wonder why Christianity is struggling. 
We're putting people in gigantic buildings where they don't know anybody. They're, 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 they're not really getting ministry that impacts and changes their lives. And what they are hearing is just the same old stuff over and over and over again. Sound to me like God needs to raise up somebody in this earth to do something. Come on. How many know when God's got a problem, He finds a solution? When God's got a problem, God goes around and He starts knocking on doors. He says, son, daughter, will you? Okay, you don't want to. Son, daughter, will you? God will keep knocking on doors. And it might just be a little church of 50 or 100 people around the corner that God picks to change the earth. It might just be a remnant in the land that God raises up to change the face of the earth. Amen? Come on, somebody. As I shared with you earlier, Pastor Debbie and I continue to be astounded and impressed and blessed and ministered to by the quality and the depth of the people that come into this assembly. The gifts and the talents and the resources. We have creative people. We have people working in the movie and arts and entertainment. We keep getting connected. We shared with you a couple weeks ago that we got to go to a movie premiere for a Christian film that they hadn't even mastered yet. Um, uh, last year, was it? Uh, the year before, I think last year at the old building, we had a movie premiere for a new Christian film that was, hadn't even been released on DVD or in theaters yet. We, we've got people in this, this ministry right now who are working on films, who are working on scripts. We've got people in full sale who are in, in other places who are working on video and computer graphics and computer animation. We've got preachers and teachers and ministers here who don't want anything to do with the internet, but they want to preach and teach and minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. We, we've got mature believers in Christ who have a heart and a desire to impart godly wisdom and, and balance into the lives of, of a younger generation. We've got a younger generation that's chomping at the bit to change the world and put hope into a world that seems to have no hope. I, I would what, what I see when I look back is I see God assembling something. I see God assembling a remnant. I see God assembling yeah. something that has the ability to impact and change this world. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. you know, statistics tell us there's something called the Internet World Stats. It's, it's a site, and, and they, they published it that as the time of their research last year, that the world population was just under 7 billion people. It was at 6,930,000. 6,930,000 and, and a handful of others. Amen? Out of that, in 2000, December 31st of 2000, about 360 million people were on the internet. Okay? Not a particularly big deal. At the end of 2011, at the end of last year, 32%, almost 33% of the world's population had internet access. Literally one third of the world's population that is over 2.25 billion people, okay? Over 2 billion, 250 million people on the face of the earth had internet access. That is a 528% growth rate from December 31st of 2000 to December 31st of 2011. It's not inconceivable to me that if, if a third of the world has it gotten in the last 10 years, at a 528% growth rate, it could be less than 10 years before two-thirds of the world have it, amen? amen. But the reality of the matter is we don't even need two-thirds. Just one-third will work. Amen? One-third will work. Mobile device use is skyrocketing. People are walking around watching video on handheld devices. It's just, it's skyrocketing. I mean, pretty soon, cords, we just, cords are going to, they're not going to exist. They don't exist for your phone. They're, they're going away for your TV. And, and by the way, TV is history too. If you haven't figured it out yet, TV is history. People are not going to continue to watch television and have people tell them what they've got to watch when they can go online and watch whatever they want, when they want. They can pause it, they can rewind it, they can replay it, they can download it, they can take it with them, they can watch it in the car. Nobody wants a television set, not even one that's not corded to the wall. It's mobile devices. And it is the internet. And it's where everything is going. And it's going to video. Amen? Amen? I mean, praise God, we're burning CDs, we're burning DVDs, but you know what? Video is what we want. And we want it on demand. And we want to be able to pause it. We want to be able to take it with us. And it's not just us. It's the whole world. It's the way the world's going. So I'm here to tell you that the church, the assembly that's going to be positioned to change this world, think about it. Think about if you could reach 
a third of the world, almost for free. I, I mean, the internet is almost free. If you do it right, you can actually get it for free. You literally, if, if you orchestrate it right for free, you can touch over two billion people with a gospel message. You can mentor two billion disciples for free with a building no bigger than this, just with some talented folks. Amen? You just need some teachers and some preachers and some ministers. You need some people that want to put some movies together. You need some people that want to put together some short films. You need some people that want to put some music together. You need some people that want to put some animation and some computers together and, and, and some graphics and, and, and all kinds of... You can, you, can, you can create a video package and, and, and you can take that experience and that wisdom and that teaching and before you know it, almost overnight, you can be discipling, ministering, ministering to two billion people. Yeah, I know it's only a third of the world, but you know what? If we set our sights on ministering to ministers, we don't need to reach every single person with the internet. We just need to reach the people that are ministering to the people. There, there's a two-fold thing that we need to be doing. And listen, I'm not suggesting that we all stay home on Sunday mornings now and just get out our mobile devices, okay? We're going, we're going to have church on Facebook. All right, listen. We come together in a local assembly. The Bible is very clear. Do not forsake the assembly together of yourselves. We are to come together, okay? But it's not practical for me to preach here this morning in Orlando and to preach later this morning in Zimbabwe, okay? You just can't... Not, just, not going to work, all right? Plane's not that fast yet. However, we can minister in this building, and that message can be delivered to an indigenous pastor in another nation, and he can carry that gospel out. We can minister here this morning, and, and, and a Sunday school teacher in another building in the same town that doesn't want to admit that they know us can secretly watch the message online, get fed, put their name on it, and, and, and preach it to their class. And you know what? I'm good with that. I hope everybody steals the true word of God to coming out of this place and so they can Amen. preach it and teach it and have it. We ain't selling it. We don't own it. And, and they, can, they, can, they can minister. God. We want to be a body of the disciples. Amen? Amen. We, we, look, we're not trying to build a building. We're trying to build the kingdom of God. Yeah. And we can use the tools and the resources. We, we can use this technology. I know that people say, well, you know, the internet, it's of the devil. No, it's not. No, is the devil going to use it? Yeah, yeah, he is. Can God use it? Absolutely. Yes. Amen? Amen. Was nothing created that was not created by him yeah. and for him. Amen. It was created by him for his purposes. It was created to spread his peace and his word. And if you'll allow me just a moment, I'll show that to you biblically, and then we'll close this message up. Amen? Amen. Ecclesiastes, and I am going to read this out of the King James. We'll go back to the King James, the new, new King James this morning. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1. We're only going to have verse 9 on the overhead, but I'm going to start at verse 1 just to give us the backdrop. I just feel the word today. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all of his labor which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh. But the earth abideth forever. The sun also rises, and the sun goes down, and it hastens to his place where he arose. The wind goeth south, and turneth unto the north, it whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth according again to his circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, and the sea is not full unto the place from which the rivers come, thither they return again. All things are full of labor, man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. Now here it is, verse 9, and it should be on the overhead by now. The thing that has been, it is that which shall be. That which shall be done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Let me read that again and see if I can do better. The thing that hath been is that which shall be. That which is done is that which shall be done. And there is now new thing, no, no new thing under the sun. I'm so excited about this revelation. I'm jumping to get there. Listen. Here's the thing. We live right now in time. We live right now in the natural. We're in this world. We're not of this world any longer. We're of Jesus Christ, but we're in the world. 
Amen? Amen. There is a cyclical nature that we see in God's creation. Amen? Amen. I know what's going to happen next September. I don't know what the temperature is going to be on any given day, but I know that if the Lord tarries, He does not come back to this earth, that next September, fall will begin to set in. There is a cycle to the seasons. I know that spring comes in spring. I know that fall comes in fall. I know that summertime is hot and wintertime is cold. Amen? At least here in the northern hemisphere. There, there's a season. There's a cycle. A cycle is something that repeats. The Bible is telling us that what has been is what will be. There's a reason for that. And listen to this because this sounds really, really cool. The cyclical nature of God's creation is the result of bringing an eternal kingdom into the natural sphere of time. God's kingdom exists outside of time. Time is a temporary governance. It's created by God for God's purposes. The temporary nature of time itself produces a resplendent cyclical evolution that is infinitely predictable for as long as it exists. I know that sounds really cool, doesn't it? We don't really know exactly what all that means, but it sounds really cool. The reality of the matter is, the result, God exists outside of time. There's no beginning and there's no end to His kingdom. It, we can't really fully wrap our mind around the fact that God exists outside of time, that there is no time where He exists. It's the reason that the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ was slain for the world before the world was ever created. How is that possible? He was created in the world. He was slain in the world, but He was slain before the world. Because God exists outside of time. The result of taking that supernatural existence outside of time and bringing it into time, the closest we can come to it is a cyclical or a circle. Think about it. A circle has no beginning or end, right? You and I, we live in this world, we live right now in the confines of time, and pretty much for us, everything has a beginning and an end, amen? We set the DVR to begin recording at a certain time and to end recording at a certain time, amen? You people ask, they say, well, what time does church start? They say this time. They say, what time does church end? We have no idea what church ends, but, but what, what is going to end soon? But, but what time does it start? What time did... We think about everything in a linear fashion. We think, when were you born? When did they die? But with God, it's a cycle because yes. there is no beginning and no end. So it creates a circle. Now think about it. Not only does a circle have no beginning and no end, but if you start at some place on the circle, say you start here at the birth of Christ, or you start here at the crucifixion of Christ, and you go around the circle, things may change. But guess what? When you start coming back around, the end looks like the beginning. Amen? Next spring will start to look like this spring. It'll start to get windy in March. The humidity will start to come back. Amen? The end looks like the beginning. Now, we're going somewhere with this. There's a reason that we threw out all that fancy stuff. Why the Internet? Why would we be focused on Internet? Why would we be focused on media? We are first and foremost to have relationships in the body of Christ. We are called to be an assembly. But we need to understand that just because an assembly doesn't have a tremendous amount of seats or a huge amount of people does not mean that it cannot change the world. Amen? Jesus Christ, with a handful of disciples, just about a dozen folks, it's told us to us that he, they literally turned the world upside down. How many think it's about time for the world to be turned upside down again? Amen? But why the Internet? Why don't we do what Jesus did? Why don't we just start getting on the roads? Remember what we said in the beginning? We had the Roman peace. There was basically one government system, one language, and there was peace. We don't live in a time of peace. I don't know if you've checked the news lately, but we live in a time of wars and rumors of wars. You see, the Internet can be that vital tool. The Internet can be that common language. It can be that road system. It can be that substitute for peace. In peaceful times, you and I just get on the street and start hoofing it and get down the road and share the gospel. In a time of war, in a time where, where Christianity is not welcome, in, in, in certain nations where they won't even allow a Bible in, 
They still ain't figured out how to stop the airwaves. They still haven't figured out how to stop the signal. They, we can for free send a message of the gospel to a place that couldn't even receive a shipment that was paid for. A remnant, a small group of believers, very talented and very gifted, could be assembled together in any given place across the face of the earth. And these, these remnants, these, these churches that are called smaller. See, today what we're doing is redefining what a megachurch is. A megachurch is not defined by the number of seats within a building, but it's defined by the number of lives that are touched by the yeah. ministry. Amen. Come on, somebody. That's a place to get excited about. We, it's too long we've defined megachurch by the number of seats within a building when God said, I poured out my blood to build a body. How many lives are being in Impacted. Are you a mega influencing? Are you a mega discipling church? Oh, I got such a witness on that. It's coming from my toes up. <clears throat> this gospel is to be preached and teached in all the world. It's not the internet alone. It's not just the electronic devices. But when you put together a perfect combination of media and genuine people, you can produce the perfect storm. You can produce... The Pox Technologica, if you will. Amen. Come on, somebody. I like it too. How many lives can we touch? How many lives can you touch? How far can your gift go through the cyber atmosphere? How would you like to know that somewhere on the other side of the world, there's a Bible study being led and they're watching your movie. They're reading your book. They're teaching your lesson. Come on, somebody. Matthew 24 and 14, and we are really closing. And this gospel, this gospel, not another gospel, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. Then we out of here. It's off to dinner. Amen. <laughs> Supper time. Come on. Going to sit down at the banquet table. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. What is the gospel? The Greek word is evangelion. If it sounds like evangelism, go figure. I wonder why. The Greek word for gospel is evangelion. And it literally means the good news. Literally the good message. And what is the good message? What are the good tidings? What is the good news of the kingdom of God? It is that the salvation that can only be found through Jesus Christ is to be received by faith on the basis of His death his burial, his bodily resurrection, and his ascension into heaven. That is the good news. The good news, the glad tidings, the good news that we share is the news that, that Jesus Christ has come, shed his blood and died on a cross, been raised in the news of life to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. We could not pay our sin debt. We could not be good enough. We could not get ourselves out of trouble. Could not get ourselves out of hawk. But Jesus paid a tap. He poured out His blood. He made a way for our souls to be saved. Amen? Amen. And we are to share that good news. Whether through art, whether through movies, television, internet, with music, with video, with a hug. Come on, somebody. Amen. It can be animated. It can be one-on-one. -on -one. Listen. The internet in and of itself is never going to reach the world. But guess what? We're never going to reach the world just sitting here by ourselves either. When we bring the perfect combination of loving people together with the ideal combination of technology and talents, truly the world can be turned upside down. Church, what's your part going to be in this?